Hi, everyone. Uh, this is my first time doing a presentation via the internet, so we'll see how that goes. But today I'm going to talk about some work I did with um, as part of my NOAA postdoctoral fellowship, which ended in August uh, of last year. Um, I am still a postdoctoral fellow and I'm still continuing this work as, as part of another postdoc I have. Um, so while some of it's completed and some of it's still ongoing, uh, feel free to ask questions or let me know if you can't hear me as we go. I will try and pay attention to the questions box, but no promises, especially if they're hard. Uh, but we will we will get started. So my postdoctoral work really focused on using infectious disease modeling and health economics to inform immunization policy in Alberta. And the main uh, the main objective was to build an infectious disease model for a disease called respiratory syncytial virus. Um, this is a disease that affects all age groups, um, but there's currently no vaccine for. However, there's a lot of vaccines in the pipeline. So there's a lot happening. And uh, a lot of the stakeholders I, stakeholders I talked to were really interested in having an infectious disease model so that they could evaluate the, the impact of any future vaccines, the cost effectiveness of any future vaccines. So we started to develop this model. So uh, today I'm going to give a brief overview of what respiratory syncytial virus or RSV as I'll uh, continue to call it is, as well as a brief overview of infectious disease modeling. I, I know there's probably a lot of different backgrounds. So I think it's a a good idea just to give a brief overview of what it is and what it can do. Um, and then I'll talk about my specific uh, model, the RSV model we built. And then finally, um, and briefly, I'll talk about a project we did looking at the integration of health economics into immunization policy um, in Alberta and where new methods or, or processes may be needed. So that's the goals for today. So just first, the, the background section. So what is RSV? Um, it is a very common cause of respiratory tract illness. Uh, as I said, it affects all age groups. Basically all children have been infected by the time they turn two and a lot of them have been infected twice. So it's very infectious and very common. Um, and this is uh, also because natural immunity is incomplete. So you don't, get lifelong protection after you have had RSV once. You just are lucky enough to get it continuously throughout life. All those colds that I'm sure you remember or worse um, can be caused by RSV. So it can appear like the common cold, maybe uh, uh, more like an influenza or a minor respiratory infection. And this is typ typically how it, how it presents in adults and older children. But it can also lead to serious illness and death, death especially in at-risk groups. So when we're talking about at-risk groups, we're talking about infants less than three months of age or infants with other risk factors. For example, if they were born premature or have congenital heart disease or chronic lung disease, all these things can make them at higher risk of infection. And this is the group that in the past uh, people have typically focused on because it was the most obvious group of severe infection, but more recently it's been noted that it's also a major issue in, in the elderly and uh, other older adults. It can lead to pneumonia and serious risk of uh, lower respiratory tract infection. So, so something to consider as we walk through this. Uh, outbreaks occur every year, it's very seasonal. So outbreaks typically occur um, between November, November and March every year and then die out through the summer and then return again the next year. So just a, some more facts about uh, its severity. Um, they estimate that about 28%, um, so this lower image down here, 28% uh, of lower tract uh, respiratory infections are caused by RSV, so a very high number, which is about 33 million worldwide. And it also leads to a high, um, a high mortality rate. And this is especially in 
developing countries. So in places uh, like Canada, typically you don't see a high rate of mortality um, in children to, to RSV uh, because we do have um, the, the support of care required and we also have uh, a passive immunization, which I'll talk about a bit more later, which can help prevent disease in the most, in the most at risk uh, groups. But globally, they do estimate that about 120 to 150,000 deaths per year in children under five are caused by RSV. Um, and then also a very high rate of hospitalization, about 3.2 million, es uh, they estimate, um, RS uh, RSV cases of lower respiratory tract infection um, require hospitalization. So as you can see, the burden of disease for this disease is very high, uh, which makes it of interest um, to, to Canada and considered a public health priority in Canada because it is the most common cause of hospitalization among infants in Canada. It can lead to very high uh, hospitalization costs uh, between five and $23,000 per case, uh, per hospitalization. And this range is because it is uh, a major risk factor in Northern communities. So Northern communities can be hit particularly hard by RSV and um, transporting uh, individuals to receive the necessary care in hospital is, as we know, very expensive. Um, actually, I was recently talking to a friend who works as a nurse up in Yellowknife, and she said, you know, we can't hardly handle uh, RSV season, let alone if if COVID starts to become more of an issue. So already it, it's a big, big issue up, up north. And as I mentioned, uh, there's this new knowledge that this is an issue in older adults. They, they estimate about 12% of medically attended respiratory tract illnesses are caused by RSV. And if RSV leads to hospitalization, it can have a mortality rate between six and 8%. So what are we doing about it? Uh, there is, as I mentioned, a passive immunization. Um, called palavizumab. It's a monoclonal antibody that, that is provided to at-risk infants um, throughout RSV season. So they have to receive multiple shots to, to have the antibodies necessary to prevent um, RSV infection. But this high-risk uh, term is, isn't particularly well-defined. I mean, there are definitions in Alberta about who can receive it, but these change every year they change when you look at different provinces, um, who is encapsulated in that high risk and who is not, um, can be quite different from province to province. With Alberta, including uh, a few more, um, not shockingly, than other provinces. So the reason this is kind of such a targeted program is this because it's a very expensive program. So it costs about $7,000 a course. So for every individual that you're trying to prevent infection in, it's about $7,000. Um, and so obviously that's, that's a quite high price tag. Now, there are two programs in Alberta, the Northern and Southern Alberta RSV programs that make these decisions about who receives palavizumab every year. Now, you may be asking, why is there no active vaccine? Um, well, they're working on it. Um, they've been working on it for a while. So actually, uh, the first vaccine for RSV uh, was tested in the 60s, I believe. And they sadly had some negative outcomes uh, around the 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 infants who received the vaccine. So they, the infants who received the vaccine had a fr higher frequency of getting RSV and, a, and often had worse outcomes when they did get RSV. Um, and it actually led to two infants um, dying with RSV infection. So this non-surprisingly scared off uh, a lot of manufacturers for a long time. But with some of the new techniques, uh, there have been there's been a push to create a vaccine for RSV. They, they see it because it has such a large burden because it infects so many age groups. Um, there is a wide 
possibility for, for vaccinations. And the last time I checked, there were 18 novel RSV candidate vaccines in the pipeline in clinical trials. And these targeted a, a vast variety of age groups. So uh, infants, um, so pediatric vaccine, much like rotavirus given very young, um, pre uh, vaccines for pregnant women, um, so they can transfer the, the maternal antibodies to their, their infants when they're born, uh, much like pertussis, uh, and the elderly, which would probably be a seasonal vaccine, um, much like flu. So a lot of different options. Um, I think only one to date has finished clinical trials. Um, the ResVax vaccine, uh, it didn't go quite uh, as they wanted it to. It, um, it didn't have uh, I don't think it had a significant impact in the primary outcome, which was uh, lower respiratory tract infections. They did see a statistical significant improvement in hospitalizations, uh, but it is yet to be licensed in, in any country. So now I'm gonna get into a bit of the background on infectious disease modeling. Now, um, I don't wanna to go into too much detail, but I think it's important we have a good sense of what this means, um, so and what and why we might use it for to evaluate um, RSV vaccines in the future. So one of the key characteristics of infectious disease models is that they're dynamic, and this is in comparison to a lot of the other models we use, um, is that uh, the risk of infection can change over time, and the it allows for the interaction of of variables across time. So the risk of, of infection in an in a, a infectious disease model is based not only on you know, contacts and your likelihood of transmission on contacts, but it's also based on the number of people in the community who are infected. And we've heard a lot of talk about this with COVID, um, but it's basically a feedback loop. Uh, a positive feedback loop where the number of people infected, if you have more people infected, this leads to a higher rate of infection because all those people can be infecting other people in the population. So you get that positive fee feedback loop that leads to um, an exponential increase in disease. You can also see negative feedback loops with uh, vaccination where people are vaccinated. This leads to fewer people being uh, infected, which leads to fewer people um, getting uh, the rate, which leads to a decrease in the rate of, vac of uh, infection. So the fact that these are all interconnected um, makes it a dynamic model. So why does this matter? What can this do for us? Why, why would we want to do infectious disease modeling in the first place? Well, we've seen many examples of it. Uh, in recent in the recent months, um, infectious disease modeling has come into the spotlight as nev never before, and sometimes for the worse, sometimes for the better. Uh, but we have uh, people have started to use it, um, or have been using it forever to predict the course of an of an epidemic or an outbreak. How how when is the peak going to occur? When is the magnitude of the peak? Uh, how does this change with um, certain strategies. So we've also seen the limitations of these models in, in capturing this. So there's difficulties. There's Because it's a dynamic model and it's so dependent on how people behave, their interactions with each other, this can be very hard to, to estimate. So just knowing there's the disease in the community means people are less likely to go into the community, less likely to do higher risk activities, which reduces the likelihood of, of transmission. Um, and so, and this is constantly adapting and, and it's hard, sometimes hard to capture that in the infectious disease model, but we can at least get a sense of what the epidemic would have been without these interventions um, and so on. It is also very helpful in evaluating interventions. And again, we've seen this in recent weeks, uh, people estimating, oh, should we, can we, can we limit the spread of infection by uh, 
looking at the, uh, by just doing trace and test, or do we need some sort of social distancing? And where is that social distancing going to be most effective? Is it, is it reducing the number of people who go to school? Is it reducing um, workplace interactions? So on and so forth. And finally, uh, though this is not an exhaustive list, it can help measure the impact of population changes. So um, one example I thought of here was for influenza. So as currently we have a, an aging population, as our population ages, how is this gonna impact our influenza rates? Are we gonna see fewer cases because um, the older adults are less likely to interact with high transmitters like children, or are we going to see higher rates of hospitalization because they're at higher risk of serious infection? So all of these things um, are, are useful when looking at, at infectious disease modeling. So this is not a course on infectious disease modeling, so I'm not going to get into too much detail in this section. But I just wanted to give an idea of the types of models and the considerations for choosing an infectious disease model. So some of the things that you should think about um, when looking at a model and some of the limitations and benefits, because each of these types of models has limitations and benefits like any other analytic um, decision. So you have to think about what is the purpose of your model? What are you trying to capture? What is the problem being investigated? What do you need to capture that? If you're, if you're talking about, um, let's say, uh, HIV, and you really need a clear sense of the contact patterns between individuals, uh, maybe an agent-based model is more relevant. If you're talking about a large-scale vaccination program and you need to capture it across a large population, maybe a system dynamics or population-based model is more appropriate. Um, so really need to think of the purpose and the object of the, of the model, what is the scope, um, and what is feasible. Because each of these models, as I said, have, have things that make them more or less complex. And as much as we can, um, we want to err on the side of simplicity, uh, assuming it doesn't dramatically impact the, the outcomes. So there are three types of models I present here. There are many more. Um, system dynamics or mathematical model, which is the model I used as part of the RSV um, study. Discrete event simulation, which is more, uh, which generally is used more to model workflow or a system. So as people move through a system, you see it a lot in hospitals or ERs, you know, where are people, um, are, are people kind of getting built up? Where, where are the delays, the roadblocks um, to move further through the system? And then an agent-based model, which really is looking at all the individuals in a population and um, how they are connected and how an infectious disease might spread to, through that population. You can also combine models um, just to make your life more complicated because already this is one of the biggest decisions you have to make when doing infectious disease modeling. Um, but it, it is possible to use a system dynamic slash, uh, slash discrete event simulation. One example would be, oh, where, where you care about the, the rate of COVID in the community, how that impacts. So that maybe is a system dynamics model and how that impacts people coming into the ER. Um, but then in the ER, you want a discrete event uh, simulation to see how people move through the hospital system. And if the number of people or the rate of infection in the community impacts that movement through the system, maybe, if you have a high enough rate, people don't get hospital beds quickly enough, so they're stuck in the ER where there's a higher risk of transmission to other members of the population um, if they're going to the bathroom or taking off their mask because they've been there so long. So it's, um, it's an interesting, it, it can be interesting to combine these models together. So 
when would we want to use because because they are complicated you don't want to have to use it unless you have to use it um, so when would you want to use infectious disease modeling in vaccine evaluation um, so really the the main time that you would should consider using an infectious disease model is when vaccination will, will impact transmission. So if we get uh, a COVID vaccine and we're giving it out widely to the population, then that vaccine isn't only going to protect the individual who received it, but because of the reduction in transmission in the community, it could also protect those people around that individual. Often what we talk about herd immunity. So we want to be able to capture those benefits because it's been shown that those benefits, if you don't capture them, then you can have different outcomes. You might have a very different uh, cost effectiveness um, findings if, if you don't capture those benefits. There's also issues with vaccination of the fact that the clinical trials often can only look short term well, the benefits of vaccine are seen into the long term. So to, to capture that as the disease changes, you often need an infectious disease model thinking of HPV, right? So uh, they had a very short term, um, they looked at short term uh, outcomes or surrogate or intermediate measures of protection. Um, but now we're starting to see the benefits on, on uh, cervical cancer. So a model can help us capture those without having to wait, you know, the 10, 15 years that that we would have to wait in, in the real world. And the last concern is if there might be indirect effects or externalities of, of vaccination. And a good example for this is chickenpox vaccine. So when chickenpox vaccine was first being considered, there were two concerns and these concerns were investigated with modeling. So with infectious disease modeling. One of them was that the age group, um, so the average age of infection for, for uh, chickenpox would increase. And as we all know, uh, chickenpox is a lot worse when you get it as an adult versus when you get it as a child. So there was a worry that we'd actually increase the rates of um, ER visits or hospitalizations due to chickenpox because we're increasing that average age because the, the virus isn't spreading in the community any longer. So uh, models helped us invex, investigate this concern. There's also concern about shingles or and the fact that if, again, chickenpox wasn't spreading in the community, uh, our immunity to herpes zoster virus, which causes both chickenpox and shingles, uh, wouldn't be boosted on such a constant basis. And therefore, people who had chickenpox would be at higher risk of getting um, shingles when the vaccine was in place. Um, so both these things were explored through infectious disease modeling. But it's not always necessary. If you're evaluating a very targeted program or a vaccine that doesn't, wouldn't, isn't impacting transmission, then it may be less important or not important to use an infectious disease model. Um, in the case of RSV, uh, polyvizumab is given to a very, very small proportion of the population who don't play a big role in transmission of the infection. So it's probably not necessary um, to use an infectious disease model if you're just looking at polyvizumab. But then when you bring a, a more universal vaccine into the mix, then is, that's when you might want to consider um, the impact of, of on transmission. Okay. I think that's all, yeah. So that's all I had for kind of my infectious disease modeling 101. Now to get into the good stuff. So the actual model we developed, the RSV infectious disease model. Now there's, there's the exciting modeling part, but there's a lot of things that go into that modeling part. So first we needed to estimate the cost and burden of disease for RSV in Alberta. This hadn't really been done um, so the, the burden of disease hadn't been done at all. It, it had been looked at in children, but not across all age groups, which is important when we're trying to fit our model. So that was, that was essential. And then the costs, um, 
again, hadn't been done across age groups, mainly focused in children and particularly hospitalization, um, which again, isn't enough information for when we're looking more broadly at the impact of a, of a vaccine. So that was step one. We then had to search the literature for the relevant epidemiologic and other economic parameter values that we wanted to include in the model. Uh, then we could build the model with these, these parameters included. And uh, the final step was then to use the model to conduct cost effectiveness analysis of different strategies, um, whether it was current strategy, palivizumab, or any of these potential future vaccines. So some of the data sources that I used for all these steps, um, largely, and uh, luckily for me, as part of my postdoc, I was, um, I was a part of Alberta Health and had access to their administrative databases. And so I used um, the physician claims database, ambulatory care and inpatient, as well as uh, population registry information. And this was largely for the costing burden of disease analysis. Um, to identify our speed cases, we also very recently got data from Alberta Precision Laboratories, uh, and this is on confirmed RSV cases in the province, uh, and then, of course, uh, estimates from the literature. Okay, so starting with the costing analysis. Um, so we decided to use a retrospective case control study to cost out RSV. Um, so we looked at cases of RSV uh, and matched them to controls, and we matched them on, I think it was five different criteria, age, sex, location of residence, so that's urban, rural, status, uh, prematurity in those less than one year old, and the Charleston comorbidity index in adults. So this um, allowed us to match uh, cases and controls and control for some of the, the costs um, that are accounted for in those aspects. Now, uh, we, use, we, are, we are using a few different case definitions for RSV and there's a reason for this. So in the results presented here, we're using mainly um, ICD codes that are related to RSV or um, RSV can cause. Uh, that, that are more generalized respiratory tract infections. Um, and then controls would have no ICD codes for those, those uh, respiratory tract infections. So that's the more sensitive case definition. We're really trying to capture a broad um, number of cases. And then we're also using lab confirmed RSV um, and, and no lab confirmation of RSV uh, to be more specific. Now, the reason we didn't want to only use lab confirmed RSV is first of all, we've been waiting for the data, um, but also is uh, it really biases your results to certain populations. So children, those are who are hospitalized are way more likely to be tested. There's been a, a movement away from testing for RSV, especially in the community. So we just wouldn't capture those more minor cases of RSV that we thought were important to capture. So that's why you pick two case de definitions. Follow-up periods, um, we gave, for, for the cases, the, the index date was the, the first date. They, they had contact with the, with, the, with the medical institution, so a physician claims or hospitalization, whatever it was. And then we followed them for a year and for one month. So kind of the acute phase and then the more chronic impacts of RSV and we looked at all cause health care costs in those periods for both cases and controls. And then assumed that the attributable costs um, would be costs associated um, with an RSV case minus their matched control. So here are some of our outcomes. This isn't uh, super interesting, um, you know, slightly more males than females. You do see uh, a slightly higher percentage of rural cases than um, the population. I think the population in Alberta is 83% urban, and in this uh, population, we get about 78% um, urban population. 
And then uh, diversity of age groups. So these are the age groups we looked at with the highest number um, of cases happening in the 18 to 49 uh, year old age groups. And that's important to remember when you're looking at the attributable RSV costs. So here are the attributable RSV costs that we found. As you can see, um, the highest cost per case, these are costs per case, um, is in the youngest age groups. So particularly under 90 days old, so three months old, um, and then the older age groups kind of after 65 and then really after 80 years old. Um, so this is consistent with what others have found. Uh, but what you have to remember is even though this uh, 18 to 49 um, year old age group doesn't have very high cost per case, because there are so many cases in this age group, it could have a big impact on overall economic burden. And this is a 30 day follow up, though we found some pretty similar at 365 day follow up. And then again, looking at a 30 day follow up, but by cost type. Um, and here you can see the differences between the cases and controls. Um, inpatient costs were the biggest contributor to overall costs, um, but only very slightly ahead of physician costs. So they were pretty consistent and then ambulatory costs were lower. Um, sadly, at this stage, we haven't been able to include pharmaceutical costs, but that is the hope um, that we'll be able to do that. Uh, and um, this does change with age group. So in those in that 18 to 49 year old age group, physician costs are actually the highest, um, it, uh, contribute the most to total costs. Whereas in the younger and older age groups, again, inpatient costs become more important. Okay. And then the burden of disease estimates, you can see here, um, uh, I know it's uh, a lot's going on in this graph. It's because we have 11 age groups, um, which was not fun for modeling. But anyway, um, you can see that. So we looked across nine different RSV seasons. The rate does change season to season, um, as is consistent with other other findings on RSV, uh, and is a lot higher in the in the kind of these bolder colors, which are the younger age groups. Um, and then a lower incidence rate in the uh, older age groups. Um, and we, we thought this was really important, again, for fitting uh, unknown parameters for our model, which I'll, I'll discuss later. The only other thing, um, so this is partially based on uh, the rates of acute respiratory infection in the population, the Alberta population, along with the percentage of respiratory tests that are positive for RSV. And this is really where you see the seasonality of RSV come out. So, you know, in February, January, in the highest risk months, you can see up to a 20% positive rate, whereas that decreases to less than 1% in the, in the off season, the July, August months, which we are getting into now, thankfully. Okay, so that um, was kind of the cost burden of disease estimates. We then had to bring together all the parameters that were needed for our model. And as you can see, it's quite a few different parameters. Um, we had to have population parameters because we used an open model. Uh, we needed birth and mortality rates. We also needed information on disease parameters. How long is somebody infectious? How long do they stay recovered for? How long do maternal antibodies last? All these things um, mainly got from the literature. Uh, we also used health utilization to, to input into our model. So percent of cases that have a physician visit or a hospitalization, and this was mainly from Alberta Health, as well as the literature. Um, we had to incorporate effectiveness and coverage of any interventions. So that's palivizumab and any future vaccines. So for palivizumab, we are still waiting from data from AHS on kind of who are they, who are they um, vaccinating with palivizumab and how effective is that? Do, do people typically get 
RSV following vaccination, as well as looking at the clinical trials of any potential vaccines. Um, cost parameters I've, I've talked about mainly from Alberta Health and uh, intervention costs are coming from, from AHS for palivizumab. And then utility parameters are coming from the literature. Okay, so now for the model itself. So coming back to this choice, we decided to use a system dynamics mathematical model. This was for a few different reasons, but the biggest one is that we want this model to be accessible across the country. It is the first infectious disease model for RSV, um, to my knowledge so far, hopefully I get it published fast enough. Um, and so we can see a lot of other provinces wanting to, to use it to inform their decision-making. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization who, who provides recommendations on on um, vaccines are interested in using it. So we want it accessible and this is probably the most accessible type of model. A lot of people understand them um, and can use them effectively. Um, it is also easier to transfer into R, which we are planning to do in the next few months. Um, so that was our main reason for, for using it, uh, but it has led to some limitations in, in what we can do with the model, which I'll, which I'll discuss later. So as I mentioned, we decided a population-based model. So that's populations moving through different disease states um, and they move based on, um, the, and the number of people in each of these disease states uh, changes based on differential equations. It was a deterministic model. So, uh, Every time you ran it, you get the same outcome. However, when we add the costs and effects, we're planning to make that part stochastic uh, so we can capture the diversity of, of outcomes. And uh, we did incorporate an element of seasonality, which is particularly important to RSV just because you do see that big increase in the winter and then a, a big decrease in the summer months. So here's just a, a simple schematic of what our model looks like. Um, so you have susceptible states, you have the primary susceptible states, that's when you're first susceptible, and then any subsequent susceptible states uh, is when any further times you become susceptible to the disease. And how uh, you determine the rate of infection, so or the force of infection as we call it, lambda, here, I'll talk about later, uh, but that determines how many people end up in the in initial infected state, as well as the secondary or subsequent infected state. And we also included possibility for asymptomatic infection. So they do think asymptomatic infection um, occurs largely in older children and adults. Um, and so it's important to capture that here they do have a lower risk of transmitting the disease in our model. Uh, once you are infected at a certain waning rate, you become recovered and then you kind of stay in this section of the model for the rest of your life, transferring between recovered, susceptible, infected, recovered, susceptible, infected. Um, there are some estimates that, that suggest you get uh, RSV basically every, every few years. Um, once we've calibrated or fitted that part of the model, we included a vaccinated state, which where you are protected from infection. So you become, vac you become vaccinated at a certain rate based on your age um, and the coverage and, and all those qual quantity qualities, um, which then again wanes over time where you again become susceptible to infection. Um, and these are all based on certain probabilities and rates. So going back to that force of infection, um, really one of the most important factors in the model, and it's one of the hardest ones to estimate. Um, so this is based on a numerous parameters. So the first parameter is beta here, which is your likelihood of transmission on contact with, um, with an infected individual. 
Um, so this is really hard to empirically measure. So in our model and a lot of other models, it is fitted to, so it is estimated by fitting your model to empirical data, which I'll talk briefly about. Um, the T function here is a the seasonality function, uh, which allows it to increase at a higher rate during the winter months and uh, at a lower rate during the during the summer months. We also have a contact matrix, um, and this so the C uh, determines the number of contacts. And this is based on age in our model. So certain age groups are more likely to contact each other based on um, empirical studies that have looked at how people contact each other in reality. So, you know, there's more contacts between 30 year olds and children because they're off, they're more likely to have children. There are more contacts between children of the same age um, because that's who their friends are. So, um, that's what the con the C represents. And then it's based on the number of people infected in the population. So both initial, subsequent, and asymptomatic infection um, are all represented here. Though um, second, uh, subsequent and asymptomatic infection have a lower risk of, of transmission than initial infection. So I think that covers force of infection. So then we calibrated and uh, validated our model using that burden of disease study that we did before. And this really, um, we're trying to get the closest match to, uh, to that empirical, our model to match as closely as possible to that empirical data. And um, over, over time, so we have six or seven RSV seasons we looked at that we tried to match um, to. And it, this helped us estimate the, the beta, so the, the likelihood of transmission on contact by age group. So um, yeah, so that was the goal of this. Uh, so that's kind of where we are. There are definitely some limitations to our model like any other model. Um, the lack there's a lack of heterogeneity in the model. Um, so for example, we can't capture the fact, um, so right now all subsequent infections of RSV act the same. They have the same risk, the same, same recovery rate, same risk of being asymptomatic or symptomatic, um, same risk of severity. This can change based on age, but it can't change based on if it's your second RSV, um, infection versus your 15th RSV infection. Uh, now, this you might want to capture this, um, and it would be very difficult within a population based model because you'd have to have a state, um, multiple states actually, for each of those subsequent infections. So, this was an assumption um, we, were, we were okay making. There's also the lack of stochastics in transmission. So, yeah, we're going to account for them in the in the costing part, but um, every time you run the model, you get the same outcome, um, which doesn't really happen in reality. You saw every year RSV um, changes based on other factors and these stochastic factors, the how, how diseases spread through a population. So we weren't able to capture that. And then finally, contacts are based on age, but nothing else. And we see in the land of COVID, that contacts often are based on other things, things like distance. So we aren't able to capture that um, contacts uh, are based on distance and by increasing distances between people, we reduce the number of contacts. So those are just some of the limitations of, of the model and some of the assumptions we had to make. So in terms of next steps, we're gonna add a high risk group um, that have higher risk of severe outcomes, uh, much like we see with RSV. Uh, we are gonna convert, so currently the, the model was developed in MATLAB. Um, we are gonna convert it to R, and this is really just to ensure the transferability of this to other provinces, um, considering R is open source, um, and they can then use the model, fit it to their own data, and run it on their own scenarios which is 
our next step is to test different vaccine scenarios and see, see outcomes. As well as our final step, would, which is to do a cost effectiveness analysis of current practice, which is palivizumab in Alberta and um, these future vaccines. And so we run the model with vaccine and without and compare the cost and effects under each of these um, under each of these scenarios. And because we're using stochastics, we'll run it multiple times to do that. So the final objective and um, one of the most interesting, but I can't uh, go into too much detail about it, but was we wanted to look at the integration of health economic analyses into immunization policy. So with the development of new vaccines and often expensive vaccines, um, there has been a increase in the number of economic evaluations of vaccines in, in recent years. You know, with HPV and shingles and pneumococcal, all these are quite expensive vaccines, a lot more expensive than the typical childhood vaccines um, we're used to talking about. And so this r raises the question of, uh, of cost effectiveness. And this has been coming to a lot of the decision makers and they are trying to make decisions about how to incorporate and when to incorporate economics into their decision making. Um, and Alberta Health um, in particular is interested in doing this. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what are the appropriate processes for that. Uh, and this comes down to the fact that the National Advisory Committee on, on Immunization who generally gives recommendations on the on the kind of the science, the <laughs> it's all science, but on the <clears throat> safety and the effectiveness of vaccines, recently expanded their mandate to include considerations of that should probably say equity, um, feasibility, and as well as economics. So they're trying to now incorporate these things into the recommendations that they give the provinces. Um, Cadiff didn't want to touch, didn't want to touch vaccines, which is fair. Uh, so now it's been put on the plate of NASI. Um, but this also means that provinces are going to get this information. How do they use it? When do they run their own analyses? Um, it's it's still a lot to figure out. Um, and so Alberta Health is trying to do that. So to help them, I um, conducted eight semi-structured interviews and uh, a review of relevant documentation for the Alberta Advisory Committee on Immunization. So this is the provincial equivalent, equivalent to NACI. So they, they're the ones that makes recommendations to the Alberta government on vaccination programs, as well as the AACI Secretariat, um, which is uh, part of the Ministry of Health uh, and is run by the immunization uh, policy team out of Alberta Health, and they are the ones that gather all the data, gather the data from NACI as, as well as other sources and present it to AACI. And then finally, public health nurse managers who are the ones who have to implement any decisions made by the, by the ministry. And we asked them questions around what are the current processes for incorporating health economics, what, did they see gaps and challenges? Did they see the benefits of, incorp of this incorporation in any of recommendations for the future? Um, this is an ongoing analysis. We are very close to being done, uh, but sadly we wanna present first to the immunization team, our key stakeholder at Alberta Health and get their feedback and their thoughts uh, before sharing those results more broadly. So that's next step and then hopefully I can I can offer more information about, about that. And that is it. Um, I wanna thank all my supervisors. Uh, there, there were a few of them, <laughs> um, as well as everybody who helped me on this project, including in particular the NOAA Fellowship. So thank you and happy to take questions. I see people typing.
seem like long questions. All right, so Kyle Riley um, asked that, uh, oh, here, here it is. Um, so you're testing cost effectiveness of upcoming vaccines. Does this mean there's clinical data available on these? So yeah, I think three of them are in phase three. So there are some, there's already some clinical data. Uh, we might need to wait to get more and more of the relevant clinical data. I know for sure there's the ResVax vaccine that has published phase three trials. So we'll probably start with that vaccine um, and then run different kind of potential scenarios for um, for what vaccination would look like in the other in the other vaccines um, prior to getting the full clinical picture. And let me know if I didn't answer your question. So uh, David asked if the betas in my model are risk of transmission, and yep, they are. So they are risk of transmission on contact. So that's why you also need the contact element. Um, so you know, people come into contact all the time. N don't necessarily mean that the disease will be transmitted. So this is the risk. What is the probability of transmitting that disease if you contact another individual? Um, so currently the vaccine is modeled not to give permanent immunity. Um, great question. They made, we're making the assumption that none of these vaccines will give permanent immunity because natural infection doesn't give permanent immunity. So it would make a pretty good vaccine <laughs> to give permanent immunity. So it is likely they'd be given yearly in the elderly population. Um, but if you're talking about doing it in the pediatric population or, or maternal population, there you're just trying to get them out of that really high risk period. So the very young age groups so are just maybe just once or twice, kind of like rotavirus, get them out of that high risk group. And then if they get it later, they, they're less likely to get serious um, disease. Jeff, it looks like your question wasn't, didn't come through. Okay, so Kyle has a follow-up. Um, so he's asking if the analysis attempts to calculate the health headroom of a vaccine, or is it more based on scenario analysis and estimates of potential effectiveness. So currently, I'm not sure I understand. I, I don't really know what the health headroom of a vaccine is, so feel free to, to enlighten me. Um, but it is currently based mainly on scenario analysis and estimates of potential effectiveness. Oh, good, applause emoji. Uh, so currently we are using quality adjusted life years along with hospitalization as some of the outcomes in our, in our model. Um, we are going to talk to stakeholders about this to see what is most relevant to them in terms of a, an effectiveness outcome um, and what they would like to see and what would help them make uh, their policy decision. So we did use some expert elicitation um, for the parameter estimates uh, where there was no published data. Um, this actually came in to, to play a lot with the costing analysis. The fact um, was we didn't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what diseases are most typically associated with RSV and how it might present in a clinical setting. So we, asked to infectious disease modelers, uh, not modelers, infectious disease doctors to provide um, advice on what they would, how they, how RSV likely presents. Um, so we could appropriately capture that 
with our ICD codes. Um, and we, we've constantly, so luckily we have a team, a great team, and we've constantly gone back to them um, to make sure our assumptions weren't off the wall. So I remember originally we had assumed that asymptomatic infection only occurred in subsequent infections. Um, but then when we took it to our, our group of epis and um, doctors and the whole team, they suggested that no, actually initial infection with RSV can also cause, uh, can also be asymptomatic. So we adjusted our model um, in that case and they've been very helpful. So no, immunizations, I don't know of any immunizations that are mandatory in Alberta. And so we will take into account, so the rate of vaccination will not only be de uh, determined by its effectiveness, but also by its, uh, by its coverage rates. And we're gonna have to use similar vaccines to estimate the coverage rate. So I kind of alluded to this, um, so for maternal vaccines, we'll look at what the coverage rate is in pertussis because, you know, new mothers are nervous. They might be nervous of, get, of getting vaccinated. So we'll see what the coverage rates are in pertussis. For pediatric vaccines, we might look at rotavirus, which is also given to very young uh, infants. Um, for elderly vaccines, we might look to uh, pneumococcal or influenza, which is taken on a yearly basis, although I hear that might change with COVID. So um, yeah, we will take that into account uh, based on assumptions from other, other vaccines. Thanks. Yeah, so that's why, um, so I was asking about comorbid conditions. So that is why we, um, one of our matching criteria was Charleston, the Charleston comor comorbidity index. It's not perfect. Um, obviously, it would be nice to take into account each individual uh, comorbid condition that that uh, comes into play, but that was um, complex with health immune data. So we, we thought this was a good alternative and you really did see, so when you looked, even accounting for that, um, you really did see a big difference in attributable cost between people who had a, a five plus on the, the CCI and those who had a zero. I think it was 10 times, the costs were 10 times higher, even after accounting for that, um, that, that controlling for those comorbid conditions. So it was, it was interesting. Okay, so I've, I have a description of health headroom. Mm. Oh, that would be really interesting. I might contact you to learn more um, about using this because I think it, and maybe talk with the stakeholders about whether that would be something that would interest them um, because I think it would be, could be very, very cool to, to estimate um, where you're considering the vaccine as effective as thought possible which I don't know what it would be for RSV, probably a couple of years of full protection. Thanks, Chris. Okay, I guess. Oh, there's a few people typing. Oh, great. Thanks, everyone. That was that was a lot of fun.